All right, so first we talk about present block cipher and it was a lightweight block cipher, so it was easy to understand. Then we talked about this data encryption standard, which is no longer a standard. We talk about it for historical reasons, but now we want to talk about something that we really use. So I think AES is responsible for 99% of every encryption on the world. So, because everybody is using it. Currently, when you're using Zoom, Actually, it uses AES. WhatsApp uses AES. Everybody's using AES. So let's see how we came up with this algorithm and why we have it. So actually, this algorithm was called Reindel and designed by two Belgian cryptographers, John Damon and Vincent Raymond. So actually, the name of the Reindel comes from the some of the letters from the last names of the designers. So uh, there was a competition called Advanced Encryption Competition, and AES and Reindel won this competition. This is why we call it now AES, Advanced Encryption Standard. So uh, since 2001, it is the NIST standard, but also, you know, ISO standard and so on. Every uh, encryption standardization organization approves AES. So it is. this is why almost everybody is using it. There were some other finalists which were also nice, like Serpent, Two Fish, RC6, and Mars. And you can, uh, none of them are broken so far. And you can use them if you want, but if you have a yes, there's no reason to use these ciphers. But if you have, you are using libraries like OpenSSL or similar libraries, you can find these algorithms already implemented there. So Reindel supported many different block sizes, but uh, NIST preferred to have a single block size because if you stand, if you want to have, if you want a standard, uh, then it should be simple and you know shouldn't have many options. So uh, AES has 128 bit block size. It supports three key lengths, 128. This security is enough for personal use. And when you choose this key length, the number of runs becomes 10. But if you want military grade security, you need you can prefer 256 bit secret key. But when you do it, you have to increase the number of runs from 10 to 14. And as you can see, this is 40% larger than this. So when you really increase your security a lot, it only comes with the performance deg degradation of. 40%, which is not that bad. Because encryption is really fast. You wouldn't notice this because you know you can reach terabits per second of encryption on a GPU or hundreds of gigabits per second encryption on CPU. So you don't care if it is 10 rounds or 14 rounds. It is really fast. So one can, sometimes people think that when you increase the secret key length, you know, they thought that the number of runs should decrease because you have more secret here. But when you think about it, information security sense, sorry, information theoretical sense, here you are trying to hide the secret information by performing many operations. So if you increase the size of your secret, it will be harder to discuss, discuss uh, uh, hide it inside this uh, operation. So this is why you need to perform more operations to hide it. This is the logic behind it. So like present, AES also uses SPN type. There are many attacks. So for the last 20 years, people tried to break AES. The crypto community came up with fantastic ideas, fantastic attacks, but all of these attacks are ineffective. So it uh, increases our confidence in the design. Also Snowden documents show that NSA doesn't have a way to break AES. So we know that a NSA could not put a backdoor, although it was designed by Belgian cryptographers still. Whenever we have a standard, we want to be sure that no agency put a backdoor in it, okay? So as far as we know, there are no backdoors in these designs. So let's recall what an SPM was. In the SPM, we had the key schedule key. This produces round keys. But in a round, we have three layers, a round key, substitution, and permutation. So let's see what these are in AES, OK? An add round key will be simple. Actually, we will be exhorting the plain text with the round key, OK? So 
AS representation is generally uh, preferred like this. So a 128-bit block of AES is divided into four words of four bytes. You know, these are, if you multiply four by four, it's a 16, so 16 bytes, which equals to 128 bits. So instead of represent it, representing it with a, as a 128 bits, you represent it as bytes and put it in a four by four matrix. So each word can be seen as a row of a matrix, right? And all of them are represent a single byte. So one round can be summarized like this. So you have the input, okay, this one. All of the boxes are bytes here. Then you perform an add round key operation, okay? Here, you are exhorting this 128-bit input with 128-bit round key, okay? Then you perform the substitution layer where you have an S box, and this S box applied to every byte. So this is an eight byte eight S box. So you take this byte as an input, perform the S box operation and put it back to its place. Okay, take this one, do the same. Take this one, do the same. So you perform 16 S box operations in parallel. Okay, so this is the substitution layer. Then we have the permutation layer and this permutation layer consists of two operations. First one is uh, shift rows. So this picture shows like this. So these axes are showing the uh, bytes of this column. So after the shift row, as you can see, this X stays at the same place. So you don't touch the zero row. But for the first row, you rotated one byte to the left. So for this reason, X comes here, this byte goes here, this byte goes here. So this byte goes left, but there's no place there. So it's come and put it here like this, okay? So simple rotation operation, but one byte to the left. So the, for the second row, you rotate two bytes to the left. And for the third row, you rotate it third bytes to the left, okay? So this operation provides kind of a diffusion at the row levels, but we haven't touched the columns, right? For this reason, there is a matrix multiplication where you take a column, multiply it with this matrix, and write the result to the same column. Then take this column, do the same, put it here, take this one, put it here. So you uh, multiply the columns with a matrix. So this way you provide diffusion at the column level, okay? So this is the add round key layer. This is substitution layer. These two are permutation layer. That is the idea, okay? Let's look at them one by one and see them in more detail. So as I mentioned, we can represent AES, like four by four matrix, but, and a byte can be viewed as a string of eight bits. This is generally what we see as a byte, uh, look at a byte, but a byte can also be viewed as an element of Galois field two to the eight, okay? This is because some of the operations here are chosen depending on the field operations. So there's a logic behind it. So they're not just random operations or the matrix or the S box are not chosen randomly. There's an idea behind them, okay? So arithmetic in Galois field is a little bit different than uh, integer arithmetic we do. So AES uses the Galois field defined by the reducible polynomial like this. A byte can be represented by a degree seven polynomial where the bits of the byte correspond to coefficients of this polynomial. Now we can perform addition and multiplication on these polynomials modulo this polynomial, okay? This more mathematical representation is better to understand the security of the cipher, but for implementation, you don't need to worry about anything. You don't need to know any Galois field or anything. You can simply implement AES if you want. So as we have seen, uh, a round function of AES consists of four operations, key addition, which is simply XOR of the round key, subbytes, use S box S 16 times in parallel, shift rows, you rotate rows to the left, and mix column, you multiply by a matrix M. When you do the decryption, you have to perform the inverse of all of these operations. So inverse of XOR is also XOR, so you don't bother with this. But in the subbytes, you have to use the inverse of the S box, in the shift rows, instead of rotating left, now you have to rotate right, which is not that different. But in the mixed columns, 
Now you have to multiply with the inverse of the matrix. So decryption, as we mentioned before, in SPN ciphers are the inverse of every operation. So if you want to put decryption also on the device or the in your software implementation, you have you also need to implement this, right? So in the hardware, it will cause more plays. But if you are using the uh, block cipher in the counter mode like op mode of operation, then you wouldn't need the decryption operation. Next topic will be mode of operation, so you will understand why we don't need decryption when we use a block cipher in a mode of operation like counter mode of operation. Okay. So the thing that we haven't mentioned was key schedule. So this image was taken from the Block Cipher Companion book by Lars Knudsen and Matthew Robshaw. So you have the master key 128 bits, okay? So this is your first round key. You simply exit it with your plain text. But for the next round, you have to modify this and obtain a new round key. And this modification step is described like this. So all of these parts or words are 32-bit words. So these boxes represent bytes. So for the rightmost 32 bits, what you do is as follows. Rotate it one byte to the left. As you can see, this one goes here, this one goes here, but the left one goes to here. Then you perform the S-box operation on all of these four bytes. Then you add the round counter here, which is a single byte value. Then the result is XOR to leftmost part, and it is now this new 32 bits of your next round key. Then this one is also XOR with this one written here. The result is XOR with this one written here. This one is XOR here, and you obtain the next round key. So in the following round, you will take this 128 bits, write it here, perform these operations again. So you don't need to generate all of them before and, and keep it in an array. You can you know, generate them while you are performing the encryption. Here, important thing is that this round constants addition, this XOR looks as if it is not that important. But if you remove this, or also at the same round constant XOR to these three other bytes, we can actually come up with many weak keys for AES in a recent study we showed it. So this round constant addition is not that uh, something unimportant, OK? This really provides good security. But this is how the key schedule works. So a key schedule for 192 bits or 256 bits looks really similar to this one, OK? They are not that different. So let me show the every step in a different picture now. So you have the input here, 128 bits. You have 128 bit round key. You XOR everything together and write it back. So how you XOR them depends on how you store them. If you store them as bytes, you XOR byte by byte and write it to its place. But generally in software implementations, it is easier to store every row as 32 bit variables. So that here you simply XOR uh, this 32 bits with this 32 bits and write it here. Or you can also do it for columns and so on. Subbytes, this is an S-box operation works on bytes. So every byte is taken as an input that, and put it into the S-box and the result is written to the same place. So this S-box is really special. It can be represented like this. So uh, this is how you read this table. For instance, assume that your input of your S-box is 3B. So, you know, the first... Uh, hexadecimal value is three, the second one is B. So you go to third row and beat column. The result is E2, so this is what the result is. This is how you use this S-box, okay? And this S-box is really special. This is chosen as the inversion of the input byte X when we as an element of GF2 to the eight. Uh, and it provides optimal resistance against linear and differential cryptanalysis. So if you can come up with a better 8x8 eight eight S-box, then this would mean that you have solved a, a very long open problem, which wasn't open for a very long time, and you can be famous. So, you know, but we will talk about it when we talk about cryptanalysis, but this S-box has differential uniformity of four, and we don't know if we can 
find an 8 by 8 s box which has differential uniformity 2. So that is an open question. In the past, we believed that there shouldn't be any, but now we believe that there should be because there is an uh, example for 6 by 6 s boxes. So why not for an 8 by 8 s box? So of course, we might say that let's try it but one by one, but the number of s boxes are really huge. Okay. So you cannot do a brute force approach to this. Shift rows, recall that if we start counting the rows from zero, so at the zero row, you rotated zero bytes to the left, so it doesn't get affected. First row is shifted one byte to the left. Second row is shifted two bytes to the left. And third row is shifted three bytes to the left. Okay, this is what happens afterwards. And finally, mixed column operation. You take a column, multiply it with the matrix, and write it back. So what is the matrix? Matrix is chosen like this in hexadecimal notation. This is important because in some uh, resources, you don't see the hexadecimal notation and you think that it is just integer multiplication, okay? But it is not so. M is derived from the parity check matrix of a maximally distance separable code. So from coding theory, they take a very nice idea and put it here, okay? So this way, it provides good resistance against linear and differential cryptances. MDS codes are beyond the scope of this lecture, but AMP's feature about branch number is important for us. Let me explain it in a more detail. So recall that we take a column, multiply it with this matrix, and the result is written to the new place, right? So recall that in matrix multiplication, you take this row and multiply with this column, and this gives you Y0. Actually, you know, Y0 is this one multiplied by x0 plus this one multiplied with x1, this one multiplied by x2, and so on. So a matrix is called to have a branch number beta if the above equality holds only when either all xi and yi are 0, or there are at least beta non-zero values among xi and yi. Okay? So... I will explain what this means. Matrix M has branch number five and it allows small changes that affect many bytes. This property provides better security against differential and linear cryptanalysis. So let me explain what branch number five means. So take a random column like this, okay? Then multiply with this matrix and obtain the result. Then make it any change on a single byte. So you are changing one byte. Branch number is five. 5 minus 1 is 4. This means that all of the 4 bytes has to change. Okay? If you change 2 bytes, 5 minus 2 is 3. So at least 3 of the output bytes must change. Okay? So this way, a small change causes a huge change, which is a good for differential cryptanalysis. When we will talk about cryptanalysis, you will understand why this is a nice choice. Of course, in the literature, there are some other MDS methods or Different matrices, which also provide similar security, sometimes better performance. So uh, this is also an active research area. So let's talk about performance AES. If it is responsible for almost every encryption in the world, then the question is, how fast is it? So efficient AES implementations are successful provided on many software and hardware platforms. So you can use AES almost everywhere. But still, Lightweight block ciphers are necessary for constraint devices because you may need, you know, you may need to really have a small uh, cipher. By small, I mean use a small area on a hardware, or you know, uh, you may need an algorithm that uses less energy, has less latency, or more throughput on small devices. So, so the current approach is like this. If you can use AES, just use AES. If it doesn't fit your purpose, then choose a lightweight cycle. That is the approach NIST follows, actually. So, although we have many fast software implementations, uh, USA, uh, we have very nice hardware instruction sets for CPU. So, it happened because USA made it a must for state officials to keep their hard drives always encrypted. So, when a laptop is stolen or lost, this is generally happens in, you know, when you're traveling with a plane, people lost their, uh, forgot their laptops at the uh, airport. 
So somebody steals it and then government documents leak. So this is why USA made it a must that you have to keep your disk always encrypted. So somebody steals your uh, laptop so you don't worry that anything can leak. But full disk encryption results in 20 to 40 percent performance loss depending on the, of course your CPU and device or read write speed of your hard drive and so on. But you wouldn't like such a performance loss, right? Because you have a very fast computer, but it is slow due to encryption. So this uh, causes you to have a very efficient, optimized implementations. But Intel and AMD said that let's put hardware level instructions on our CPUs so you can do, get rid of this performance loss, okay? So let me show you how fast we can do encryption and also explain uh, some of the results in the past. So in the past, since GPUs are very nice in parallel computations, there are many papers saying that, okay, we optimize this algorithm for GPUs and for a CPU implementation, it is 10 times faster, 20 times faster and so on, because GPUs have many cores and you can do parallel operations in a very fast way. So for instance, in a paper, uh, they show that they can achieve on a GPU like this, and the result is 80 gigabits per second. And they say that on CPU, you cannot have like five gigabits per second. So this is fantastic. It is really fast and so on. But they, in all of these papers, they forgot that CPUs have hardware instruction sets. So for instance, uh, from a CPU also launched in 200, 2013, you can actually beat the speed of this paper on a CPU, right? So these people actually compare their results on software implementations and say that they are better than CPUs, but CPUs already have hardware instructions, which are really fast. And this is one of the early publications from Intel, where they say that their hardware instructions that can achieve 100 gigabits per second, so which is really fast, right? If you divide this number by eight, it is like 15 gigabytes per second. So think about your hard drive. Most probably you don't have a hard drive that you can read 15 gigabytes in a second, right? So encryption is free. It is faster than your read and write speed of your hard drive, okay? So people keep publishing papers saying that now they achieved larger values than these, but this is no surprise because if you have a new GPU, that comes with more cores, more speed. So of course you can beat. So uh, this can go like this. So these are my results. I actually achieved 2.5 terabits per second on the recent RTX 4090. But you know, if you have the new device, of course you beat it. But also this comparison between CPUs are not that fair because Although I achieved this speed, which is like eight times faster than CPUs, a CPU doesn't consume as much as energy like this GPU. So maybe you should divide the watts of these devices to get a, a value saying gigabit per second per watt. Okay. So as you can see, a nice CPU is really at the bottom of this table. So. But of course, if you use GPUs, you can also double the speed or, you know, for per every watt. So this is a comparison that I do just to show that encryption is free, okay? If I can reach these speeds on a good GPU, you can uh, reach this kind of speeds on a very basic GPU on your laptop. So my suggestion here is that let's keep everything, every disk fully encrypted. But let's not use our CPUs. We already have a GPU, which is really fast. Encrypt and decrypt using the GPU as a coprocessor and keep your CPU free so that you don't need to bother with this. So a busy SSL server, for instance, can do all of these encryption and decryptions on a single GPU and leave all of the CPU cores for other uh, processes.